Hey everybody, this is Fred Ricciani of TSC News. In this special throwback episode, we're gonna throw it back to 2015, chatting with former WWE NXT star, CJ Parker, now known in New Japan Wrestling as one of its rising stars, Juice Robinson. The man recently scored a victory over one of the best wrestlers in the world, Kenny Omega, and he looks to put his name up there with the best as he sets his sights on the NJPW Intercontinental and United States Championships. So without further ado, Juice Robinson. I have right here on the line a very special guest, fresh off of a stint from WWE NXT, the moon child himself, CJ Parker. CJ, what's going on, man? Oh, Fred, what's up, dude? Man, you got, you're excited. Oh, you make me excited. You're literally like less than two weeks from giving your notice to WWE. You voluntarily left WWE NXT. And I guess the question I'll post to you first is, why? Well, I just think that, uh, you know, I'm 25 years old and I wanted to experience some things that I haven't experienced yet in my career that I, I didn't know if I, I would ever, um, as far as, like, traveling all over the world and, you know, really, like, earning my stripes, like all my friends, you know, uh, Sammy Zayn, Kevin Owens, Adrian Neville, uh, Finn Balor, all those guys that have just worked their tails off for years and years and did it the old fashioned way and got over um at the smallest level and then now are starting to get over at the biggest level. I just feel like I owe it to myself and I feel like that's the right way to go about things. So I'm twenty five if I'm gonna do it, if I'm gonna give that a try, I better do it now. And that's that's what I decided on. Yeah, man, I, I couldn't believe you were only twenty five. Not saying you look older, just yeah, I mean, you've been there. You've been there for a while. I think you were there for for four years when you left. It was like twenty five, twenty five. I mean, yeah, you still have yeah, plenty man. of time. Man. Well, it's funny. The developmental put some years on you, man. So I'm, <laughs> you know, the face has got some miles on it, but hey, the, still underratedly handsome, in my opinion. As as the ladies have told me, as the ladies and some mutual <laughs> friends of ours have told me uh, many many a time. Now with <laughs> NXT. You were originally in FCW before that, right? Yeah, started in uh, FCW May of 2011. So were you homegrown, or did you have any experience on the indies prior to signing with FCW? Or WWE and then later uh, the station FCW? I, you know, I wasn't, I, w I wasn't homegrown. I was a trained guy. I was a pro wrestler before I got there. So I knew, I knew uh, my way around the ring before I got uh, to Dr. Tom. But, um, you know, I didn't do much on, on the Indies uh, before I got there. Just a, just a couple years and, you know, just kind of got my feet wet, just did things around the uh, Chicago land area. Nothing really to speak of. And then I luckily got signed really young, and um, now here I am. <laughs> yeah, here here you are. And uh, I, look, I look at your career, and for years people were telling me, man, you got to check out the, you know, the C.J. Parker guy. He's really underrated. He's really underrated. And I'm not going to lie. At first I wasn't feeling the whole – environmental gimmick or whatever but over a period of time I, I, you could just tell you worked really hard to try to make it work you make a lot of guys look really good even when you weren't always on the the winning end of things and when you put in your release and it was made official and it was, and it was made public i mean the outpouring of support and praise from guys like i mean not just i mean enzo Mori had great things to say about you but you mentioned it was sammy zane kevin owens finn bauer i mean these are the best of the best putting you over so obviously, there's something that they saw that unfortunately not a lot of fans got to see when you were in NXT. What do you feel like you bring to the table that fans haven't seen? I think I don't. I don't, I don't, I don't think the fans know um, like how passionate uh, I am about wrestling and how much I love it, and um, the fact that I'm going to do it. <laughs> Until the day I die, I'm gonna wrestle when I'm 60 years old. I know for a fact, and um, I'm not gonna stop until I'm excellent in every area of wrestling. It's it's all I uh, it's all I aspire to be as a, as a man, <laughs> as, a, as a hell of a pro wrestler. And um, seeing all those people say all those things about me, man, it just made me, it made me feel so good. It was. Uh, it's hard to even actually put into words. It was it was insane. Um, <laughs> I like to think, you know, if my friends were in charge, <laughs> maybe things would have went a little different. But no, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's just it's great. It's it's a great uh, group of guys down here, and we really bonded and became friends. And 
you know, we did all the little shows all over Florida together. You know, we're in the performance center every day for hours on end, popping each other, making each other laugh, and it's impossible to not uh, to not become friends with everybody. And those guys, um, if any of them left and I would have stayed, I would have said the same thing about all them because they're my brothers, and I love them all. You're talking about how, how passionate you are about the business. I mean, you just talking to you for a few minutes on the air and off the air. I could, I could certainly tell that. Uh, for fans that don't really know much about you, who kind of drew you into wrestling? Who was one guy that you saw on TV that immediately got you hooked? Uh, well, I think everybody says Shawn Michaels. But, uh, Shawn Michaels. Um, Steve Austin, you know, The Rock, and Chris Jericho. Those were uh, huge for me when I was 10. You know, I was born in 89, so... I'm about nine, ten, ninety-eight, ninety-nine. You know, here. wrestling, <laughs> yeah. and and uh, those guys, you know, um, around that time, the, the attitude there, I was hooked, and that was that. Uh, as I got a little older, and I started to watch um, older stuff, you know, Randy Savage and Kurt Henning and Ricky Steamboat, and um, you know, Bret Hart, all those guys. Those are those are my kind of guys. Those are the guys that that I watch and. I still watch him, but I love. And when they brought you back in NXT a, a couple years ago, or I guess kind of repackaged you, did they specifically tell you what your gimmick was? Because I know later it kind of became like an environmentalist uh, and all that jazz, but uh, before, I don't know, it was almost kind of like, I don't know, a PG version of a pothead. Uh, well, the, um, I would say less rough to find them more like the word thrown around was hippie. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. I don't think it was ever. There was never like um, a day I woke up and like they, they pulled me into an office and they were like, "All right, brother, you're gonna be a hippie. Ready? Go." <laughs> that was that never that never really happened. What happened was, you know, I I was just a guy. You know, I, tw- I was 22, 23 year old kid in boots and trunks, just trying to figure out who he was in the wrestling world. You know, curly hair and um, you know, just kind of generic. You know, I had personality and I had stuff, but I wasn't focused in the general area. And um, I broke my wrist at practice, and uh, I was out four or five months. And w- when I was out, um, you know, I wanted to come back different. I wanted to, you know, look cool. To me, wrestling is all about, uh, you, you know, now, now people see me, oh, I'm the guy with dreadlocks. You know what I mean? That I, li- I like that. I think wrestling, needs, you need to be like that. You need to set yourself apart, and you need to look, you know, you know, colorful and eye-catchy and all that. So... I always thought dreads were cool since I was little, and uh, so when I got hurt, I asked uh, I asked um, the office if I could get dreads, and I said, "Sure, give it a try." So, so that's what I did, and um, you know, I put some colors in there, and I really, really made it like flamboyant over the top. And I think um, that, coupled with the uh, you know the colorful bikers that I was wearing, and um, next thing you know, I'm coming out to a Jimi Hendrix um, <laughs> rip off song, and. You know, the lighting's all, like, trippy and psychedelic. And then I'm um, practicing my answers. I'm like, oh, maybe you should dance. And like, oh, God. I don't know if I do dance. I don't think I dance. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm going to learn. I'm going to figure out it. I'm going to figure out how to do it, you know? So um, I think it all just kind of took on a life of its own. It was kind of like a, it just snowballed into it. And then um, I think it the, de- the day before I debuted was um, the day before that was when they chose the music and when um, – I uh, first was like, okay, I'm going to dance as I come out here, kind of, or, you know, I saw an excuse for a dance, and all right. <laughs> so it was just kind of like, kind of last minute, kind of let's get it going, you know, they were big on characters at the time, and uh, that, it's since changed, but at that point, they were like, character, 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 we want characters, you know, Tyler Breeze, Sylvester LaFleur, uh, CJ Clark, you know, th- these are characters, you know, that they, they're completely different. Um, you see them, and you know exactly what they are. Um, and, that, and that's kind of how it happened. It was never a conscious decision by one person. It was kind of like a gradual thing with uh, a lot of ideas thrown in and then just uh, all of us just trying to adapt and evolve it and make the best of it as we went. And you did have some great entrance music. I will, I will say that. Yeah, I like I like the second the second one I had better. But yeah, the first one was, it was cool. It, it was cool. I, I was a little disappointed, though, because once you kind of became the guy for the greater good, I was kind of hoping they'd uh, bring back that little segue that Simon Dean used to have because, you know, it's environmentally friendly or at least it seems environmentally friendly. You could have come out with it or, or you know what, like a smart car. You know what I'm saying? Did you ever try to petition 
to, to get a smart car, kind of like be like the environmentally well, safe Alberto Del Rio. I think that would have been pretty cool for the gimmick. Well, the thing about uh, full sales, I think it would have been kind of hard to get a uh, Segway or a smart car, especially up like the uh, stairs in the back to get on the uh, uh, stage to come down the ramp that's only about 15 feet. Uh, <laughs> so I think it would have came off even lamer than um, me dancing and doing the uh, – uh, wiener swivel in the middle of the thing, so. <laughs> but whatever, and you know, if Simon Dean did it, I, I don't want to do it. No, I want to do. I want to do me, not Simon Dean. True. Well, you know, with a smart car, I think a smart car would would have been cool. All right, I I do see your point though. Would would have been cool if they, if they hooked that up. Uh, when you were signed to FCW, were you signed by Johnny Ace or was Triple H already kind of taken over developmental at the time? Well, no, I was signed by uh, Johnny Ace and Ty Bailey. I think maybe Ty Bailey. I can't. I can't even remember. Yeah, you know? I didn't really read it. Uh, sign it. Where to sign that? Right, here we go. <laughs> you know <laughs> what like, I mean? It's like oh WWE. But okay, believe, cool. It was Ty Bailey who, um, who I believe was the guy. That's the guy I talked to. That's the guy who um, told me I was signed. So, yeah, I guess the answer to that is Ty Bailey. Now you did spend some time in FCW. Obviously, you spent a number of years in NXT. What would you say, besides you know, the obvious production value uh, of everything, what would you say was the biggest difference between, say, like FCW under uh, Dr. Tom, Norman Smiley, a few other guys, to NXT where it was, you know, Bill DeMott, still some of the same trainers from FCW sprinkled in with some uh, new faces like Coach Gunn? Uh, it just got bigger. That's all. It, uh, it, was, it was when Dr. Tom and um, uh, Joey Mercury and Norman Smiley and Steve Kern were down and – Southdale Mabry in the little warehouse with three rings and about forty guys. It was great. It was excellent. People, there were stars there, and they made they um, they helped the stars become or come into their own, and then they moved up, and it worked. It was great. It was fine. Um, but uh, then Triple H uh, put his hand into developmental, and everything just got bigger and better and uh, better. You know what I mean? Um, everything. There was more coaches. There was more uh, trainers. The roster was or. Uh, the roster was bigger. There was more ring. There's, it's just, it just became very. Um, it just grew overnight, and uh, developmental slowly became um, more attractive to people. Maybe outside the business, maybe a guy who, uh, you know, played football his whole life, and uh, WWE thought maybe he had potential to become a superstar or, uh, wrestler here. Um, maybe that guy would walk into Dale Mabry and maybe not be, you know, blown out of the water. But now those guys, they walk into uh, the PC and they are blown out of the water. I think that place is badass. It's uh, state of the art. It's got everything you need if you want to be a pro wrestler. De- definitely looks badass. I definitely got to take a trip and and check it out. I mean, I've I've seen the pics. I see people tell me all the time. Talk to Dallas Page a few months back. He, everybody, you know, veterans, rookies, people that have been athletes before are are blown are just blown away by it. I guess it's just something you have to. You have to see. Well, yeah, I think it's like it's pretty much the first of its kind in our business. <laughs> you know, it's it's incredible. Definitely. Now, there is something I feel like is a little concerning with NXT. It's something great, but it's also concerning. In the last few months, particularly since Kevin Owens has gotten there, NXT has started to become more of a brand. You hear Triple H using the word brand. It's not developmental. It's a brand. And that's awesome. And it looks like they're trying to recruit more independent talent. Some names rumored, you know, Adam Cole, ACH, the Briscoes. You're a guy that, while doesn't have the experience level of a Kevin Owens, of a Finn Bauer, are somebody that certainly had their respect. But for every CJ Parker who, who knows what he's doing, who's a younger guy, there are guys like, say, uh, Baron Corbin and Enzo Amore who have a lot of potential, but there's kind of a big you know learning curve. Say if they sign, let's just say tomorrow they sign the Briscoes and they sign ACH and they sign Adam Cole and then you have Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, all these other guys uh, on top. And then you got Baron Corbin and Enzo Mori and guys like that at the bottom. Do you think that'll negatively affect NXT in a way since there would be a bigger learning curve? Or do you think over time it would help the younger guys, the more inexperienced guys, become better being around great workers? Well, the second part of that is right. Anytime uh, younger guys that are new to the business are around guys that have more experience and that are seasoned in the business, they're going to get better. Uh, but as far as Enzo Mori and um, Baron Corbin go, um, they're both doing great. They're both um, uh, learning quick, and they're both going to be just fine. And um, I think that if you're going to be good as a pro wrestler, you're going to be good as a pro wrestler. And um, 
whether you're whether it was Dale Mabry or whether it was the PC, you're gonna figure it out. Whether it's uh, a roster, whether it's a roster of five guys and you know the most, you're gonna figure it out. Whether there's a roster of a hundred guys and you know the least, if you're gonna figure it out, you're gonna figure it out. And those are two guys that are gonna figure it out and that are in the process of figuring it out. Um, and I think with uh, guys like uh, the Briscoes, Adam Cole, ACH, those guys coming here would just it's it's great. It's great for everybody. Um, it's it's going to help the younger guys, and I think um, those guys coming here, um, they probably would enjoy working with guys like Enzo and Baron Corbin because those guys are uh, great workers that probably love the fact of helping guys that are a little less experienced than them. I think uh, NXT is a really good place to be right now, regardless of experience, and it's only going to continue to get better and better with time. And it seems like from the outside, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like very much like kind of like a family atmosphere, at least uh, amongst the wrestlers. Huge, huge family uh, atmosphere. See, I think a lot of people forget, like, uh, now we're only at full family, we only do our TV show about once a month, maybe twice a month. And then we do uh, little live event shows, you know, uh, all over Florida, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and, you know, the first part of the day on, on Thursday and Friday, we're at the PC, you know, grinding away, uh, training in the rings, training in the weight rooms, um, doing promos, and we're together all the time. And then we all live here in Orlando. So when we don't have any, when we're not, um, we're not at PC or not at a show, and we're at our house, um, you know, wrestlers, you know, when they slow down and stop doing stuff, they tend to get bored pretty easy, you know. So then we're hanging out in our free time. So it's it's without a doubt a family. We're a team. It's a great group of brothers down here, I said. Great group. I'd imagine it was very hard to leave NXT, although, you know, to quote you, you did it for the greater good uh, of your own career. How that, <laughs> Can you kind of give, give us a little bit of detail on what that conversation was like with management, whether it was it uh, Paul Levesque or whomever? Was it just, hey, you know, I need to go somewhere else to get better? Uh, did you kind of express feelings of leaving beforehand? I mean, how would this go about? Well, it wasn't that I need, I need to go somewhere else to get better because I mean this place is where you want to be you know um, and incredible coaching and training there's no doubt in my mind that I would continue to get better here but I just felt that it was time for me to just you know try try a different way because I felt like maybe I was plateauing I felt like I there was a spot that I had um, that maybe I wasn't going to be able to get out of. And, and being so young, I didn't want to be known for being the guy that did what I did on TV for, for too long, you know, uh, for a very, you know, I, I want to get out there and get all kinds of experience and come back with a fresh coat of paint. You know what I mean? And maybe then um, things, things will go differently. Not that I was um, bitter, upset, or frustrated with what was happening. I just knew for me, and um, as a performer, I needed to, you know, stop and try something else and go a different route to continue to grow. Um, the talk was, it was a great talk. I went in, into the talk worried and um, afraid, um, not knowing how that they how they would perceive what I was saying. And I, I shouldn't have worried because they are great and they knew that I had my mind made up and they knew that it was a tough decision for me. And they knew that I it was something I had to do, and they were very supportive. And um, it was ended on good terms. And in the future, who knows? Maybe I would come back here. Maybe I would, won't. Just because it ended in good terms, and we're all friends, you know, and everybody uh, gets along great. And they were good to me, and I was good to them. It's still business, and in you know a few years, maybe they don't want me to be back. You know, maybe maybe I don't. Won't, won't see myself coming back um but i think you know the door is always open and it, it couldn't have closed out for me any better and can you just describe kind of working under triple h i mean here you are 25 years old and, and you got signed in your early 20s grew up in the attitude era all of a sudden you're getting mentored by the game what was that like yeah well yeah it's very very surreal for a while you know it's very uh it's you're nervous. It's I was nervous about it for a while, you know, because I look up to him so much and have so much respect for him, and you know he's the man. And 
the big, tall, dan- tan, uh, jack dude in a, in a suit. You know, he, he can be intimidating, you know. But as you, as you get to know him and you see how passionate he is and how much he cares about NXT um, and how much he cares about the future, how much he cares about all, all the guys that work on him, all the, everybody in NXT, um, you know, the the ice slowly breaks and it, it becomes... It becomes easy, and then before you know it, whoa, like, hold on a second, I'm, I'm working under Triple H. You know, that'll that'll come to you every once in a while. Much like Dusty Rhodes, sometimes I'm like, geez, Dusty Rhodes is like watching me do promos for two years, three years, four years. Wow, Dusty Rhodes is watching me do promos. Wow, Triple H giving me advice on a mask. You know what I mean? It's it's when you stop and think about it, it's like, oh man, hello, <laughs> this is awesome. You know what I mean? Did, did the Attitude Era fan in you ever, like, think... Uh, I mean, I don't know if you ever did this or not, but did the Attitude Era fan in you, the eight-year-old in you, ever think, man, I want to ask him about this random match from, like, 1999 or something? Uh, no, because, you know, it's all it's all business, and, yeah. and TV is the most important part of our... Um, of our... Anything we do, TV is, you know, the most... There's the most pressure on us. We want to do very well for him. Um, he, he wants us to do very well, and, you know... There's no, there's no really time for that, and at least maybe, maybe a quick, a quick thing here or there, a joke here or there, but nothing like, no fanboy stuff, yeah, man, nothing like that. Uh, I think one time I told him uh, he he does this thing where uh, Harley Race did it too, where you and Shawn Michaels did it too, where you run into the somebody throws you into the corner and you you hook and you flip out and fall fall to the outside. It's kind of like a, a bump that he did very well that he always did. And uh, I did it on one TV, and uh, I think we we made a joke about it or something. Just like a little thing like that here and there. Yeah, he's a great guy, man. You, you'd be surprised uh, once once you you get to know him. He's very easy to talk to, and um, he's awesome. So, so what you're telling Daddy fans right now is the future is safe with Paul Levesque. Oh yeah, dude. I would I mean, I wouldn't put anyone else in charge of it. He's he cares about wrestling. He always has. I mean, if you look at his career and know anything about him, he always has. And you can tell that he always will. Now, there was a lot of controversy, though, a few months back with, with Bill DeMott. And to be fair to Bill, at the very least, he's polarizing. But, I mean, I interviewed him a few years back. It seemed like all things considered a cool guy. Obviously, he has people that criticize him. But there's also other people, most notably Antonio Thomas, I've spoken to him before, Brad Maddox, Chris Jericho, who speak very highly of him. What was your experience like with Bill DeMott? I think Bill was a passionate guy. He was uh, proud to be the head coach. And um, he was always the first one there, the last one to leave. He put everything he had in that XD. Um, he went from the uh, from Dale Mabry, the small warehouse, to um, to the PC, the multi-million dollar PC. And he saw that get off the ground. And he was a part of it. He was hands-on with it. And it was he, he loved it. Um, and that's, I think that speaks volumes on, on Bill. Who would you right say? Right there along. And I was just going to ask, who would you say is the unsung hero of NXT as far as trainers go? I mean, we hear about Sarah Del Rey quite a bit. You know, we've heard it. We've heard about yeah. Bill. We, we, I know uh, Jason Albert just started, so I don't know how much you got a chance to really work with him. Is there anybody that you'd say is kind of under the radar that's been a big influence on the stars in NXT that maybe doesn't get enough credit? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, all the coaches are awesome. I mean, I think all of them are awesome in different ways. They were assembled in a way to where each one of them has a certain strength. Um, but I, I feel like not, not enough people talk about uh, Robbie Brooks' side and not enough people talk about Norman Smiley. And those two guys are awesome, man. And they put in a lot of time and a lot of hard work. And they know they both wrestled all over the world. And they can teach you any hold. They can teach you any counter. They they know you know they're so technically sound. Um, and those are the guys. If if you want to learn anything wrestling wise, um, those are the guys. You know. Uh, and then uh, Billy Gunn, he he's uh, was a top guy at the top time, and he has a way of doing things that's very awesome. It's very. Um, he likes the simplest way, and that's a beautiful thing. And uh, I feel like not, not enough people know how good of a trainer he is. Um, Terry Taylor is has incredible psychology. I mean, he wrestled um, 
Pat O'Connor, for, for God's sake. So, like, this guy has a wealth of knowledge. And just to sit around him and hear about stories and hear about, you know, just, like, the old way of doing things. And his, his story is incredible. And he understands exactly what gets over. And um, he's the man. Um, everybody, dude. Every, everybody there, you know, they wouldn't be there unless they were the best of the best. And that goes for all the coaches. How cool is it to see the women getting over as much as they are, particularly Sasha Banks and Charlotte? I love it, man. I love uh, when anybody gets a chance. And uh, I love that uh, the girls down here are getting a huge chance. And, and they're doing great, man. They're, sh- they're, they're showing everybody why they did, why they deserve a chance. You know, um, yeah, dude, I, that four they had a couple of uh, specials ago, I was extremely, like, I loved it. You know, they were out there working their tails off. And who... who couldn't respect that you know what I mean and when they do things like that they're just going to continue to get opportunities and they're going to continue to show people how passionate and how hard they work too you know uh, I love it dude I'm really proud of those those girls how long did it take Kevin Owens to forgive you after he broke his nose uh, I'd probably say about oh, four or five seconds maybe okay. because Kevin's the thing about Kevin is he's a pro wrestler in every way. Well, you know, I hit him, his nose broke. Uh, he said, oh, man, I think he broke, I think he exploded my nose. And I looked down and I went, oh, brother. Yeah, I think I did. But uh, then the blood started to come. And then you can hear uh, the crowd. It, it, when you're there, you can hear the crowd, like, realize what had happened, <laughs> that there's blood pouring out of him. And Kevin knew, and uh, I think probably right away, that it made his debut that much better. Um, because what other character, I mean, that's how I would want my Kevin Owens to debut. <laughs> you know, I would want his face to, exp- I mean, we didn't, we didn't plan that, you know, those things, you know, they happen, but I would want his nose to explode, cover, just cover everything in blood, and then have him still prevail and whoop whoever's ass. He's whooping, you know what I mean? It's, it was great. And then you got the referee, uh, Drake, trying to wipe it off, and Kevin don't care. He doesn't sell it for a second. He's just dead set on making an impression and whooping my ass, and that's exactly what he did. Uh, I thought it was beautiful. And I, when I watch it back, I'm like, hell yeah. I wouldn't change one thing there. I'm glad I broke his nose. And, Ke- and Kevin thinks the same way. He's happy that I broke his nose. <laughs> so it, it made the match that much better. Thanks, everybody, for watching TSC News this week. Next week's episode, we take an in-depth look at the brand new Madden NFL 18 video game. Until next time, everybody, as always, enjoy the matches and games.